good to have you all here with us this morning. Glad you came. If this is your first time or you're relatively new here, uh, our senior pastors, Pastors Jeff and Karen Wells, are away this morning. They're at a church, the Country Church in Malala, a church that's near and dear to us, some friends of ours. They're ministering there over the weekend, and so we just, we send them our prayers and our blessings, and they send their love and their greetings. We have, how many of you know we have great senior pastors that love the house of God? And as honored as they are to have the privilege to minister elsewhere, they truly love this house. And so I always make it a point to remind you that they're, they're happy to get an opportunity, but they're sad to miss any Sunday at this house because they love this community. But while they are away, uh, I, I'm speaking this morning. My name is Thomas. If you're new here, fairly new here, uh, my wife and I are the youth, young adults, and kind of some assistant pastors here at Rock Point Church. We're so excited that you're here, and I'm so excited to get to the opportunity to speak to you. If you've been around a while, you may have noticed it's been a while. I haven't spoke since pre the birth of my beautiful son, which is sitting on the front row right now. It has been about, <laughs> not Justin, <laughs> don't tempt me with the jokes. Okay, <clears throat> it has been a few months, um, and I just wanted to take this opportunity briefly to say thank you to this house. Um, in those about 11 weeks, he'll be, old, he'll be 11 weeks old tomorrow. In those weeks, there were some rough patches. We had a couple of hospital stays, some severe sickness with the little man. It was tough. But this house was such a blessing to us in community, in prayer, in text, in food. So we wanted to say from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much to the house. We love you guys, and we're so excited to be here. We're so excited to have little man on the front Row. So something about Melissa and I is we are not very car savvy, okay? Now I've shared a little bit about my uh, deficiencies in the automotive department before, but I would love to take this opportunity to also throw my wife under the bus, amen? <laughs> it's a great opportunity in time I preach. So when we got married, we had this uh, tiny, super orange 2004, I think, Chevy Aveo. Now, uh, it was much nicer looking than the 99 neon that I drove, but um, how many of you know when it comes to cars, what it looks like isn't as important, isn't as, important as what it does, right? That it would, if it runs, if it's reliable, if it's easy to fix, those are all important things. Now, we had kind of a perfect storm in our marriage where we had this Chevy Aveo, which just so happens to be um, kind of a problem car, hard to get parts for. Also, we had problem drivers. Uh, that would be me and my wife. We, don't take very, we didn't take very good care of our vehicles. Now, we had this season of our life where my wife would drive uh, about a half hour away to take some college courses. And she would go, and she's a music lover like most of us are, especially when we're a little younger. Uh, I love music too. But how many of you guys know there's something just therapeutic when you're alone, driving on the freeway, cranking some music, right? Something therapeutic. So one day on the drive home in this tiny Chevy Aveo, my wife is doing what I could only imagine looks like something out of a scene of a movie. She is just belting it out. The music is so loud. She has no idea what's going on around her. Until finally she hears some faint honks, okay? Some beep, 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 beep. She looks in the rearview mirror and discovers that someone is not only driving very closely, but trying to get her attention. Well, she didn't realize. At first, she assumes, hey, this person's a jerk. What are they doing, right? Honking, laying on the horn. Finally, the guy gets over into the other lane. He gets her attention, and she's doing one of these, like, what, what? And he's like, his, he has fear in his eyes. He's afraid, not for his life, but for hers, Okay. Finally, he gets her attention. She rolls down the window and he says, your car is on fire. <laughs> there is, uh, unbeknownst to my beautiful wife, there is smoke billowing out of the engine, okay? I don't know how she didn't see it or smell it, okay? Worst of all, the music is so loud that she can't hear the dash as the dash is yelling at her because the car is overheating, okay? And it's just going beep, 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 beep. So 
Every sign, she had every sign afforded to her that something terrible was about to happen. And yes, the car overheated. I think that time our water pump, blew, or some, our head gasket blew. It was terrible, okay? Super expensive fix, not even worth what the car was worth. Anyway, she was so distracted by the enjoyment of the music that she was listening to, she missed every sign, right? She missed the smoke. She missed the smell. She missed the visible the, and audible sound of the dash. She even missed the kind gentleman who she assumed was a jerk honking at her repeatedly to get her attention. The point is she should have known, right? This morning, I wanna to talk to you from the simple title, the writing on the wall. Now, this is a phrase that we use commonly to indicate something that is going to happen pretty clearly or something that, in retrospect, seems pretty clear that did happen. Are you with me? Essentially, it's something that you should have seen coming. Let's read in Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. And we're going to dive into a decent portion of Scripture this morning. How many of you know it's okay to read the Bible in church? Amen? Amen. Amen. It says in Daniel chapter five, verses one through six, and this is in the ESV, it says, King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver, silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. The king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, thank you so much for these moments we share together. Thank you, Lord, for the honor and the privilege to gather together in your house. Lord, we are so thankful to be together in community, so thankful to have easy access to your word. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's alive and it's powerful. Lord, I pray that this morning you would open the hearts, the minds, the ears of the people to hear what you have to say to us today. God, let your word be like a seed planted in our heart to produce good fruit. Use me, God. Let it not be my word spoken, but yours. In Jesus' name, everybody said... Amen. So over the period of the last few weeks, Pastor Jeff has launched us into a new series covering the book of Daniel. And it's been really cool because if you're part of the community, you've also been going through a journal, a journal that has the same title as our series, which is The Great Exploits. And we're going through the book of Daniel. And over the last few weeks, Pastor Jeff's covered Daniel chapter 1, chapters 9, and 10. But to really understand, and I'm going to be covering Daniel chapter 5 this morning, but to really understand it, we need to make sure we have a good foundation and background on what we're talking about. The book of Daniel takes place after Babylon's first attack on Jerusalem. They plundered the city, its temple, and took waves of Israelites into exile, starting with the wise and the capable. You can reference prophecies about this happening in Isaiah 39, and you can see the account in 2 Kings 24, or even in Daniel chapter 1. And among these exiles were four men that we've really been focusing on. Daniel, and each of these men are from the royal line of David. Daniel, and who we've come to know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now what's interesting about the book of Daniel is chapters 1 through 6 are filled with accounts about Daniel and his friends, some of the things that they've gone through, God's deliverance. But chapters 7 through 12 are Daniel's visions, which is what Pastor Jeff has emphasized lately. Chapters 1 and 8 through 12 are written in Hebrew, but chapters 2 through 7 are written in Aramaic. And what we see, and Pastor Jeff outlined this a few weeks ago, is that in this book we have progressive parallels. That chapters 2 and 7 correlate to each other, chapters 3 and 6 correlate to each other, and chapters 4 and 5. Now, why do I mention that? Because I'm covering chapter 5 and we've yet to do number 4. So, I'm going to give away the farm a little bit on some chapter 4 stuff, and whoever has to speak on it will just have to figure it out, okay? 
Chapters 1 through 3 give accounts of Daniel and his friends being recruited to serve Babylon and eventually pressured to violate their Jewish identity. But time and time again, they chose faithfulness to Yahweh and did and, and God not only miraculously protects them, but prospers and elevates them. Now, chapters 4 and 5 par- parallel on this theme. They are both about kings of ba- Babylon that are marked... Catch this, by pride and warned by God to humble themselves. It's a prophetic theme in here this morning. How many of you guys enjoyed worship? Some of those words, all about humbling ourselves, right? I believe that God has a word for us this morning. So now we come to chapter five after Nebuchadnezzar and all the things that we just outlined. And we meet this king, Belshazzar. Now, something to note real quick in the the language used in the Bible, it says that Belshazzar was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, what you find in Scripture is there is language that is cultural, historical, and um, just different. That word father actually means ancestor. It means predecessor. Belshazzar is actually the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. His father, Nabonidus, is the actual king of Babylon at the time. But Nabonidus is traveling around Arabia, setting up altars to false gods. For about 10 years, he does this. And while he's gone, he sets his son, Belshazzar, as interim king. He's essentially just the crown prince. Are you with me? Now, this is important to understand some of the the politics that go on in this chapter, but it's not crucial. And here we see Belshazzar is throwing a party, a real rager. Now, some historians talk about uh, why this party is being thrown. Maybe it's an annual feast. Some say it was in direct defiance and ignorance because he knew of an impending attack coming upon him. Others say that it was actually a a ritual to enlist the help of some false gods. But in either case, what we see is we come to this scene where Belshazzar throws this party. The wine is flowing. There's immorality happening. And he takes it a step further and he says, go get me. The items taken from the temple in Jerusalem so we can use them. You with me? And as he's using them, as he's desecrating God's holy instruments, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a hand appears and starts writing on the wall. And I love scripture, how it makes it clear that people are scared when you're like, of course they're scared, okay? It says that he lost his color, that his, trub- his, that his thoughts troubled him. But here's my favorite. It says his knees knocked together, right? That's like my favorite dance. Melissa hates it. His knees knocked together. Now, there are historians who have done studies on this idea. And we most have found that that is the first time the idea of knees knocking together is found in antiquity. Pretty interesting, right? That God, God scared this king so bad that his knees knocked together. And we read on. Verses seven through nine, it says, Then the king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. There's another hint at uh, Belshazzar's actual place. The reason he can't offer second is because that's his position. His father is first, right? Then all the king's... Wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and the lords were perplexed. Here's my first point as we dive into this uh, chapter and this scripture this morning. And I want you to catch this. I believe this is a word of the Lord for the house. My first point this morning is that truth is a person. I have small children, and I'm so thankful for the school that my eldest daughter is. She's in uh, second grade. She's seven years old. She reads amazingly. Now, I don't know if this is scientific, but unfortunately, I think she has inherited a terrible biological trait from me, and that is I have atrocious handwriting, like so bad it's borderline criminal, okay? There, There are times I will go somewhere where you have to write something out, which seems... Like, what century are we living in? Anyway, I'll write it and I'll warn the person, the clerk or whoever it is. I'll be like, hey, just so you know, I have bad handwriting. And they're like, oh, we see it all the time. Oh my goodness. Like, 
Like I'm a criminal. Like what, what did you do, okay? Now, my daughter's handwriting is developing and I'm sure it will get much better than mine. But have you ever had those moments as a parent where, you're, where your child writes a note and they did the right spelling and it's very sweet and they give it to you and you feel like you should be working for the CIA because it can't decipher it? I'm like, right? You, you, are, you don't seem qualified to decipher that code. And here's what I want you to catch in this portion of scripture. The world, the known world, the known world's elite enlightened and educated failed to interpret the mysteries of God. The elite, the most educated, the enlightened, they couldn't figure out what God was trying to say. When we are in search of truth and you have been, you will be, you might be right now. There is no spiritual counterfeit and no cultural fad that will ever stand up to or against the wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit. Truth is a person. John chapter 14, verse six says, Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Here's my encouragement for us today in the year of 2023. There is no self-help guru, no author, no social influencer, no politician, not even a doctor with a degree that stands to Jesus. If you are in search of truth and revelation in your life, if you find your mind foggy, if you need truth, those things can be good, but they are worthless if it doesn't start in the word of God, the person of Jesus Christ in pursuit by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Truth is a person. Let's continue. Verses uh, 10 through 12, we're not going to read. I'm gonna just kind of summarize them. But here we see the queen, which is actually Belshazzar's mother, comes in and tells him of a man named Daniel, who in the days of Nebuchadnezzar was named chief of the magicians, enchanters, and astrologers because of his divine knowledge, understanding, and ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems. And so, naturally, Belshazzar says, get him, bring him in, let's go. His knees are knocking, his face is all discolored, he's freaked out, right? He says, bring that guy here, which is where we pick up in verse 13, which says this, then Daniel brought in before, was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, you are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. I have heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you and that the light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of this matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, you should know that when you study this chapter, although we're not going to dive into this, there is a lot of interesting language and uh, cultural and political um, jousting happening even in the scripture we just read and the one that I referenced before that. There's some family stuff going on. There's some kind of sar sarcasm, honestly. How many, did you know that the Bible can be sarcastic sometimes, which just makes me feel better about it? Okay, just kidding. There's a lot happening in that scripture, but here's what I, I want you to catch the most. Belshazzar says, hey, if you do this for me, I will give you a position of power, which means fame and notoriety, and I will give you things, gold, purple linen, cool stuff, right? I will reward you if you do this. Here's my next point. I want you to catch this. You don't always need a gold star. Daniel chapter five, verse 17, here's what it goes on to say. Then Daniel answered and said, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. I have a whole message in my heart about this point right here. We live in a gold star kind of culture where you feel like you need to be rewarded for everything. Now, hear my heart and don't get me wrong. Are the blessings of God real? Yes, yes. Does God reward us for some things? Absolutely. But here's what I want you to catch. Daniel said, I will not be bought. I will not be bribed. I'm doing this because this is what God has called me 
to do no matter what I get out of it. Are you with me? You don't always need a gold star. I remember as a young kid, a lot of my friends would get allowances, okay? Um, we weren't like poor, but we, we weren't super affluent. And I remember trying to negotiate with my parents to get an allowance. Some of my friends got an allowance based on the chores that they did. And so I sat down and I negotiated with my father as I received a, a very interesting grin on the other end. And he said, um, I'll consider potentially an allowance one time, but I'm probably never going to pay you to do what you need to do because you're part of the family. You with me? That there is an expectation regardless of my reward as a child in that house that I'm going to participate in the duties of the family. That I'm going to do dishes, I'm going to clean up after myself, and I don't get to protest just because I don't get a reward. And yet, how much of the Christian church in America runs on this idea? As if God is some sort of vending machine a slot machine, or if we have some sort of carrot to offer him. Well, God, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. Can I just be very clear? The mercy and grace that we receive because of the finished work on the cross is the only thing that we should, we actually don't even deserve it. We are way beyond ever even deserving that, amen? Now, do I believe in prosperity on this earth? Absolutely. I'm not coming against that. What I'm doing is saying you don't always need a gold star. There are things in life God has called you to do just because he's called you to do it. Amen? Amen. Let's move on. Verse 18 says, O king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed. Whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up. And whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken away from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast. And his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed with grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the most high God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. So before Daniel directs his attention to the actual writing on the wall, he begins to prophesy and speak to Belshazzar. And he reminds him of his grandfather, his ancestor, his predecessor's sins and failures, which we can't get too far into because we don't know who's going to cover chapter four. But here is essentially the point. Nebuchadnezzar has been confronted with the power, the reality of Yahweh, the one true God, Okay. And even then, he still chose not to humble himself, but to rise up in pride. God warned him. He didn't listen. So God touched him and made him like a beast. He was naked, running around, eating dirt, like a crazy person, okay, literally. Until, again, with another opportunity, Nebuchadnezzar humbled himself, and he was restored. So Daniel's reminding of him of this when we come to chapter 23. And here's what I want you to see in the NLT, for you have proudly defied the Lord of heaven. Here is what Daniel's chapter four and five are primarily about, pride. The pride of the kings of Babylon who wanted to make themselves like God. Belshazzar's pride is what marks his name in history. And here's what it leads to. Verse 23 goes on. It leads to blatant irreverence. It says, And the vessels of his house have been bought, or sorry, brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk wine from them. Here, the king of Babylon, Belshazzar, blatantly is irreverent towards God. He knows better, but he fails to honor God and desecrates what he has called to be set apart for holy use. 
You can find that all throughout the test, Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 40, verse 9, Numbers 18, 3 are some references on how God has called these instruments at that time to be set apart for holy use. Here's my point that we can learn, one of the points that we can learn from the mistakes of Belshazzar. Don't taint what God has called holy. Well, what's that? Is it my fine china? No, it's not your fine china. It's you. Genesis chapter 1 and 2. God made man in his what? Own image. Psalms chapter 8. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 4, 23 says to guard our hearts. And 1 Peter 2 says that we are a chosen generation. So what is supposed to be set apart? When you give your life to Christ, you are. So don't defile yourself with the things of this world. Are you with me? What does that mean? Well, simple things that we all need reminding of, like maybe what you take into your soul. What kind of movies are you watching? Are you tainting what God has called to be set apart? What kind of music are you listening to? Here's one. What kind of news are you taking in? We could get real practical and talk about how our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Are you treating it that way? Are you with me? We're not gonna go there. Don't taint what God has called holy. His pride led to, led to blatant irrelevance, which led to idolatry. Verse 23 goes on and continues to say, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. But the God in whose hand is your breath and whose, and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. And here we see something pretty cool. Daniel gets a divine revelation. He calls them out for worshiping these false gods, but go back in time a little bit to the beginning of the scripture. Daniel wasn't there. He just got called in. So God gives him a divine revelation exposing false gods and idolatry and identifying the one true God in his infinite personal nature, that he is a God who knows us, that he's watching us, that he's interactive, which what implies that he can also be known. We can go there for a long time. That's a powerful scripture. But Belshazzar's pride led to blatant irrelevance, which, or sorry, irreverence, which led to idolatry. And it sets it up perfect when Daniel says that God knows you. He holds your breath. Because then he turns his attention to the writing on the wall. Jan Daniel chapter 5, verses 24 through 28 says this. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and the writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Meeny, meeny, miny, mo. Just kidding. <laughs> <clears throat> meeny, meeny, tekel, and parson. Uh, some translations have you parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Meeny, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Now, I know this is probably one of the more interesting portions of the scripture, but it's actually simple in application. In interpretation, it can be complicated linguistics, right? Uh, Daniel chapter 5 is written in Aramaic, but God is writing to them in Hebrew, which is written right to left and at the time had no vowels. Uh, this is part of the reason that some translations leave out the you, but the you just simply means and. And as a reminder, if you didn't know, whenever a word is repeated in scripture, that's for emphasis, Okay. Essentially, what it says is numbered, weighed, and divided. The other thing about Hebrew that's similar to English in some ways is that there are definitions of a word and there are implications of a word. But what, what the writing meant was numbered, weighed, and divided. Here it is in very, very plain English. God has evaluated you and your number's up. Ouch. God has evaluated you, your heart, in your actions, and your number is up. We're gonna go a little deeper into that, but before I do, I wanna go backwards. Back to Daniel chapter 5, 22, because I think it's important that you see this. Here's this point. He should have known better. 5, 22 says, and you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this. Belshazzar cannot, he cannot plead ignorance. 
Now, I, I, if you're a parent in this room, or, well, most of us were at least once, a, you know, we were all once a child, right? <laughs> We've all heard this phrase or used it, but you know better, right? There is a certain degree more mercy and grace when I am um, disciplining or correcting my child on something they were ignorant in. But there is a lot less when it's something they knew better. Why? Why? Because that's rebellion. That's defiance. Are you with me? And Belshazzar knew better. In Proverbs, it talks about not moving the ancient boundaries. And I don't know who this is for this morning, this little blurb of a point, but I want you to, to know God is evaluating you in a positive, good way. He, he loves your heart and he wants to help you, okay? But there are some things you know better. Are you with me? It's no mystery what you're doing, how you're acting. Let's move on. Here's an intense point. <clears throat> Surrender or die. <laughs> I have a picture I want to show real quick before we look at this scripture. If we could show this picture. This is uh, me at Pastor Josh's bachelor party about a year and a half ago. We played paintball. How many of you enjoy paintball? Anybody? Oh, more people than I thought. I've only played paintball a handful of times, and I have a ton of fun. Now, what you have to understand is I grew up in the video game generation, including first-person shooters, okay? So automatically, I think I'm a rock star with a paintball. It's just like, that's how my brain goes. It's pride. It really is. Um, there's this rule in paintball that if you sneak up behind somebody, it's not kosher, it's not polite to just shoot them in the back. I mean, there's a rule in combat like that too, but... We're talking about paintball, okay? It's not polite, especially in like the back of the head or something. So what you're supposed to do is there's this phrase that we use. If you come up behind somebody, you say, surrender or die. Now, I'm very stubborn and I am very prideful. The reason this picture is significant is if you can't tell, I got shot in the face, right in the mouth right there, okay? The reason I got shot in the mouth is because I overestimate my own paintball abilities and I never want to surrender. And I always think that I could be the equivalent of Jason Bourne or John Wick or 007 on the paintball field and turn around. Turns out all I do is get more welts, okay? I always die, I always die because I'm prideful. Daniel chapter 5, 29 through 30 goes on to say this. Then Belshazzar gave the command and Daniel was clothed with purple, a chain of gold, and was put around his neck and the proclamation was made about him that he should be the third rule of the kingdom. Let's stop right there. This doesn't contradict the point I made about not getting a gold star. What you, do, what you see is that Daniel was given divine knowledge about what was going to happen and God positions him in a place that he needs to be for the future. Are you with me? He still made the right stance, which is to say I wouldn't be bought or bribed. But now let's move on to verse 30, which says, That very night, Belshazzar, the, child, well, the Chaldean king, was killed. Belshazzar was killed. Here's the difference between chapters 4 with Nebuchadnezzar and chapter 5. Both puffed themselves up in pride, opposed God. Nebuchadnezzar was stricken with madness as a warning. He repented. And was restored. Belshazzar says, thanks for the translation. No repentance. No humility. So no mercy. Are you with me? Don't let pride kill your destiny. We serve a just and powerful and almighty God. Now I want to be careful and clear what we don't, I'm not asking you to develop some kind of like picture of God that he's chasing, around, chasing you around with a gun on the back of your head. That is not who God is, okay? But he will not be mocked. Are you with me? There comes a point in our pride and our persistence and our irreverence and our idolatry in this life and this world where God is saying surrender or die or give something up. Maybe he won't take your life, but it could be the death of your destiny if you hold on to your pride. Are you with me? At this time, I'm gonna call up the worship team as we kind of land on this more upbeat point. Again, I wanna take you back in the scripture to show you something that I believe is significant. 
I don't want to leave you thinking like, oh, God's just chasing me around. If you go back to Daniel 5, verse 5, I want you to catch this word. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared. The New King James Version says that hour. We serve a God who not only allows us to study the past so that we can correct our current trajectory, but he will show up in the middle of our debauchery to warn us. He is not distant. He is not cold. He is not simply pointing the finger. In this moment, what we see is a God breaking through the supernatural into the natural to perform miraculously, to get somebody's attention and say, stop this madness. That's how good our God is. He isn't simply sneaking around with a gun to the back of your head. He's saying, stop. I don't know how I could write any clearer. Stop doing this. Are you with me? John 10, 10, Jesus says that the, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give you life and more abundantly, right? Proverbs chapter, or sorry, Psalms chapter 23 talks about how the goodness of God is chasing us down. God will take every step, every measure to get your attention. The question is, do you have the music up too loud? Can you understand what God is saying? Are you even paying attention? Or is your faith, is your trust, is your confidence in the elite and enlightened of this world? Are you too focused on what the doctors and the, and the influencers say about this matter? Reading the next fad book about it? Or are you listening to the voice of God who's trying to get your attention and interrupt your pride to save your life? Amen? Let me go ahead and have the band start playing as we stand to our feet this morning. Pride is an ugly thing. And in Daniel chapter five, we see that the life of Belshazzar was marked by pride. He didn't get the hints, he didn't see the signs, and he paid dearly. And this morning, the Lord has spoken already prophetically about being a house who embraces humility. You know what pride is? It's arrogance and self-righteousness. Humility is, is the opposite. <laughs> it's saying that I am insufficient because it's saying I'm not a big deal. God is. Amen? I think it's in Chronicles where he says, if my people would humble themselves and pray, I would listen to them, forgive them, and heal their land. What God calls us to do in response to our pride is humble ourselves. How do we humble ourselves? We pray and we turn away from our sin. What's turning away from our sins? That's literally the definition of repentance. <laughs> sin means to miss the mark, okay? Repentance means to do a 180, which means you're back on track. So God calls us, if we're living in pride, to talk to Him, to repent, and turn around. And in response, he'll not only listen when we're speaking to him, he'll forgive us and he'll go one step further and he'll heal us. Amen? So this morning in response, as the team is gonna play in a moment, I wanna just take this opportunity as God's already spoken so clearly through the prophetic to open our hearts and ask God to take a look and say, God, is there any place in me that I have allowed pride to lead to irreverence, that I have taken what is holy and tainted it? Is there any place in me that has be become idolatrous, begin to worship the gods of this world? Is there any place in me that is looking for truth when my truth should be found in you, Lord Jesus? Is there any place in me that is only looking for reward rather than being a son and a daughter on mission? My encouragement to you as the Lord deals with us and the Holy Spirit moves on us is that we would use this opportunity because we know better to surrender. Amen? Let's just begin to pray right where you are right now. If you would just lift your hands, if you want to take a posture of humility like we did earlier, whatever that is, let's just do business with you and the Lord.